Blessings, everyone. Thank you for joining me. It is my great honor to have as my guest, Anthony Disco. He is the founder, and I will put Anthony's um, website in the show notes or description. Anthony is the founder and director of the LTA for the Sacred Hearts in Philadelphia, where he does commission work and other professional services as devotional art consultant. Upon graduating from the University of the Arts, formerly Philadelphia College of Art, he was the recipient of the Fulbright Hayes Grant, wow, to travel and study in Italy, where he attended studios at the Accademia delle Belle Arte in Florence. His current commissions there include Bronze Stations of the Cross, a series of porcelain murals for the Rosary Walk, the four pendentives mural depicting the doctors of the church, the Baldacchino angels, and the narthex ceiling mural of the visions of Guadalupe. He taught anatomy, relief, and symbolism at the Sacred Heart School in Florence. I'm a little intimidated to talk to you today, Anthony, but thank you for joining me. Oh, thank you for having me, Joseph. I appreciate it. Thank you. I really respect your work. Um, for people that don't know much about art, I mean, I have a degree in it, art history, but um, I would say that Anthony's style or I don't know if you say like school, um, is sort of classical realism. Is that fair? I'd say more, um, <clears throat> I, I'm not really a realist. I'm, I'm, okay. uh, I do a lot of work from memory, if that makes sense. I really very, very more involved with uh, studying anatomy so that, uh, and I think this, this was sort of the Renaissance model, if I might use that to the point where you can put it aside and invent. And I think that was always at the heart of really great Catholic art, invention. And that's sort of the, I, I'm actually putting a course together for the training of the memory in Christian art, because we, I think if we get back to that a bit, um, you know, I mean, we've been, artists have been using their memory since cave painting, what happened? So um, the copyist schools, are not really helping. You know, I, I, I taught at the Sacred Art School in Florence for, uh, well, up until 2019. And I found it was very, very difficult uh, because the students were learning how to Photoshop collage oh. compositions. And then they, they're, instead of painting from life or even painting from imagination, they were, they were painting from their laptops. And I said, this isn't working. What am I teaching anatomy for? You're not learning anything. They they weren't using so, like like site size method. Excuse me, I'm sorry, I didn't Anthony, hear that, Joseph. An Anthony, they weren't using like a site size method, something like that. They were doing well. <clears throat> that's another thing. There's no, I can't think of any great work in 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 terms of Catholic art history where site size was used. Okay. So they've all followed this uh, sort of neo-atelier method of we're going to do site size drawing. And they've been doing that at the Sacred Art School as well. Okay. Uh, I don't know why. Um, and doing barg drawings, copying from Xeroxes of this 19th century guy that talk about it just doesn't make sense. Because, first of all, um, the barg method is not how light and shade works. And then... Uh, one of the wonderful things I think we have in, in, in sacred art is I say there's, there's sort of like a, um, uh, a trinity of light. And that, by that I mean we have light from God the Father. you know, And that's where splendor comes in and, and highly reflective surfaces and gold leaf and all those things. And we see it in, in, in orthodox work as well. The divinity is always gold leaf, silver leaf, the... Um, I'm seeing icons behind you, the, uh, the reposé that goes on top of, that's the oklad, the, the, which roughly translates, believe it or not in Russian, as paycheck, but I realize it's the bonus, it's the um, um, salary, it's the gift, it's whatever we want to call it and translate it as, but um, where the physical is done two-dimensionally and the divinity is done three-dimensionally, that's uh, always been represented by 
by gold and splendor like that. Then light on uh, the opaque object. This is where I, I think, you know, Giotto and Cimabue and all these Byzantine, I, um, excuse me, Italo Byzantine masters come in where it's, it's the incarnation, God the Son, light on the opaque object, and then light through, which is the Holy Spirit. Yeah. You know, this is. Um... This is what um, Anthony's referring to, the oak lid here. And then if this one actually you can remove pretty easily, I won't do it because, but, and then the painted, oh, the painted panel, yes, is, is underneath. Yeah. Um, Anthony, for, for people that don't have a background in, in art, I wanted to go back a little bit and talk about what an atelier is. Um, one, one of my um, favorite artists, he's kind of forgotten, is an uh, American artist, Richard Lack. Um, he was a he was a, re, a realist, and um, when I was reading about his life, he um, he was part of an atelier, and in, in, he was part of that Boston school in the the early twentieth century. Who was his um, teacher? Oh gosh, Ives Ives Gamel, and um, I, I, the, I'll, the, I'll let you describe it. But the I I um, started out in art studio. And I went, I went, I didn't, when I got out of high school, I didn't know what to do. And um, I went to a, the local community college, which was very tiny at the time. This is uh, 25 years ago. And the, the art professor there, there was like one. And um, he was a working artist and um, an architect. He was, he was kind of like you, a Renaissance man. Cause when I looked at your website, you, you know, you, you have drawings, you have paintings, you have sculptures. And, and he was very much like that too, was it just confined to one medium? And um, it was very much like an atelier where he was sort of the master artist and we were the students. And um, he had a certain method uh, of, of teaching art with, which included life drawing and sight and size and, and all that stuff. And um, that I, I was, and it's sort of like an apprenticeship type of schooling that goes back to the Middle Ages, which I've always been very, very interested in. So could you describe what the Altaïr Altaïr method is of of teaching art? For for me right now, because I'm doing it, my school is is essentially what I call peripatetic. It's wherever I am. And so if (laughs) if I'm invited to Chicago to do the course, I do it there. If I'm invited to Florence to do it, I do it there. Um, I'm going back up to Ender's Island to teach at the, um, uh, the, the sacred art school they're putting together there, which is, I think, going to be very, very good. Um, if you're familiar with uh, Ender's Island and its retreats and things like that, I'm working with a young man there, Hunter, who, and helping him develop the curriculum. So wow. I'll be doing that this summer. And um, so I, I think for me, when I do it here in the studio, and I did it all last summer, I take students through this training of how to, even if we have references, which we do, I've got plaster casts of, of you know, beautiful Renaissance things, and all, but um, to train them simultaneously in form memory. And uh, so I put together, Joseph, a course on um, form memory slash creation. And um, by that, I mean, if we follow the seven days of creation in terms of scripture, and because I, I think this is also, Joseph, the difference between East and West. Right. Once we moved into the so-called uh, Italo Byzantine, going from Cimabue to, uh, to Giotto, et cetera, and, and finally uh, Beato Angelico, um, there's, some compositions were kept in place, especially when we look at Fra Angelico. But the, um, the Western church decided to, not decided, it's, but you, you start to see this invention. And it really comes out of uh, uh, St. Francis of Assisi. We know that for sure. It's nothing he ever said about art, but it certainly is things like, you know, Grecia and imagining the nativity. And I think that was a real stimulation. And of course, the uh, moving from the um, uh, Christus Triumphans, the, the triumphant Christ to the, to the Christus Patiens, the suffering, long suffering Christ. And we see a really incredible change in anatomy 
uh, when that happens, where gravity is taken over and real light and shade is put on the body. And um, things he said, like, you know, remember that the flesh of Christ is no different from the person sitting next to you. Yeah. See, you I, I, and yeah. that doesn't happen. We don't have that in, in Orthodox art. No. Not no. supposed to. Not supposed to. And then, of course, um, the changes in uh, the use of, uh, of the figure, period, you know, in, 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 in flesh. Uh, when and why and where and how nudity was acceptable and not, you know, and we, we see all that in the Gaberdi doors as we go from the creation of Adam and Eve, nuditas naturalis, and then criminalis as soon as they're expelled and, and um, along with the baptism of Christ, even the Orthodox know the, 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 the baptism of Christ is one where, and you can see in the nudity, in the uh, mosaics rather, that the, the transparency, Christ is, is completely nude in baptism because yeah. it is only witnessed by St. John the Baptist, the Holy Spirit, and two angels. As soon as the, <laughs> for better or for worse, as soon as the, uh, the, the, uh, the church started to include, or the R started to include in, in church art, other witnesses to the baptism, Christ is then covered. So only those, uh, only other people, like, you know, of course, St. John the Baptist, angels, and the Holy Spirit can witness Christ without clothing. Yeah. It's very interesting, you know, and, and, and so I think the imagination, the, the, what I call the Christian imagination, and, um, and for memory, and allowed artists to develop compositions that otherwise we would have been able to do had we remained, uh, you know, completely Eastern. Do, do, do you think that that um, that development from Chimabua to Jodo, do you think that has anything to do with with um, the the rediscovery or the avail availability of like classical works of sculpture? Because I mean, by the time Michelangelo comes around, he's looking at the Belvedere torso, and yeah. and um, they did, didn't have that. They yeah, they didn't. They really didn't see that. They heard about it but they didn't have real examples of it. There's, there's nothing in, in uh, I mean, Pompeii is not even discovered at that time. So it's not as if they could, uh, and then even, even Tarquinia, all the, all the Etruscan uh, painting, which again, didn't resemble that at all. But um, so they had very, very few examples, if any. I really wow. think there was such, when I think, and this again, just comes from, having taught for years at the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts, uh, I could never quite understand why, you know, these students are very talented. They'd learn anatomy and they'd learn chiaroscuro from cast drawing and, and even perspective. Um, and then all of a sudden they'd stop and they didn't know what to do with it. And I'd walk in the studios, you know, their private studios for critique or whatever. And they would go, their paintings and drawings would become flattened. And I always would say, they felt that they were making some advancement. And I always said something, I know it was to, to irritate them. I'd say, oh, I, I see it shows the pre-Renaissance model. What, 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 this is, oh no, no, this is, you know. I said, no, well, that's the pre-Renaissance model. You went flat. And, um, and I realized after a while that those three elements of perspective, anatomy, and light and shade were really developed at a great period in terms of church history as well. And coming, when the three of them come together, there's almost no choice when you use the word classical, to, other than to be epic. You yeah. know, that's what they contribute the best to. And I realized these students didn't have anything epic that they wanted to do. My, my best students that would absorb that and use it, when I taught in the illustration department, the guys that went on to cartooning, but they want the hero anyway. That's what their cartoons were all about, the, the superhero. So they had an understanding on how to use those things. Yeah. And, and yeah, and Joto did those, gosh, sadly they were damaged by that earthquake. But Joto did those, um, the frescoes of the life of, of St. Francis in Assisi. Yes. That's, that's probably yeah. what people know him probably most. 
or those and you know, and the arena chapel in uh padova that's yeah. the the whole life of christ cycles there so that's he did that with assistance but i think the hierarchy you know one, one thing i i, I kind of figured out I, by looking at those frescoes that the teaching talking about teaching and hierarchy of, of lessons you can imagine that you know if, if you had an apprenticeship you know they've got this wonderful um geometric borders going around them okay you're you're 12 years old 10 years old and you're going to paint those little triangles in red white and black and that's all you're going to get to do and when you get good enough at that you can paint a portion of that blue sky because uh -huh. that's flat and i think that, that after that was probably well, if you're good enough at the sky, now you can go onto the geometric planes of the buildings in the background. Yes. And if you get good at that, you get, get, get some vegetation. <laughs> if you get good at vegetation, you can get some drapery. So yeah. we're, we, we're teaching the verse now. We're teaching all these, these, these classical skills. They go out the window and the students graduating, you know, putting boxes together or talking, really just talking. I always say, you know, the, the lessons now is I, I was, um, the, you go to art school and the teacher says something like, well, I want you to bring in something tomorrow that deals with line. You know, and I was the kind of kid that would go home and copy an ang drawing or something, you know, and you go in the next day and the kid that brings in the garden hose <laughs> is the one that wins. The teacher. See, folks, this is what I was talking about. See that? That's, uh, that's cool. The, the, so we're we're we're, invent, we're we're uninventive now. We just you got to be clever, and and you know sacred art doesn't really call for that. You can't uh, try to be cutting edge and all those things. And no, you bring up art. something. Yeah, you bring up something very important that relates back to the my question about the Altaïe is that I think a lot of Americans, especially, have the image of the artist like Monet sitting by himself on, with an easel in Giverny or whatever, you know, and, yeah. um, that, that's the idea of the artist. And, but the medieval, and, and this goes yeah. back to Byzantine, is that um, you had, it was a school, you had a master artist, yeah. and then you had a lot of students, apprentices, you know, ar around him. That's why when you see a lot of, um, if you go to museums a lot, like I do, you'll see the school of, you know, so a lot of times these were, they're not, the artist is sort of indeterminate, but they know the style. So they must've been probably a student of, I don't know, Da Vinci or whatever. So um, that's, I, I wanted you to talk a little bit about that of what people's imagination well, is like the lone art. Yeah, yeah, we're, we're still stuck there in a way because, um, uh, and we are seeing it as well in church architecture where it becomes more about the artist than the, the mm -hmm. subject. And um, yes. then of course, we're, we're still not over what I call the Van Gogh syndrome, yeah. where, you know, um, I must be a genius, everybody hates my work, <laughs> you know. And uh, we haven't outgrown that. It's a wonderful thing that, you know, but it's, we, we forget that there are people who were valued, whose art was great and it still is great, like Da Vinci, Michelangelo, Raphael, etc. There were people who were thought to be good in their lifetime. And then, you know, and this is true for music, all kinds of different forms, and then declined in, in favor. Um, people who were not good, and then became famous. That's the one we, we kind of think we, we want to be right now. Uh, and that's the, the Van Gogh syndrome, who weren't, weren't famous in their lifetime and then became famous after death. And then there are people who were never good in their lifetime and never good after death either. So it's, you know, pick one of the four, it's going to happen and you don't have a lot of control about it because you're not, we don't have control. One thing that one teacher said to me when we were still in school, he said, the one thing that an artist can't, does not have control over, and that's the period in which he or she were born, was born into. Yes. And, um, you know, and he said, unfortunately, folks, you were all born into a low art period. And I think that's where we still kind of are, Joseph. Well, who was that? Who was that? Um, that? <laughs> his name was Walter Erlbacher. He was um, uh, one of the teachers at um, uh, 
University of the Arts. His wife, Martha Erlbacher, was a phenomenal teacher, just phenomenal. She also taught the New York Academy and um, did one of the best paintings ever, ever of St. Catherine Drexel. Um, Walter did, um, for the Eucharistic Congress uh, meeting here in 1976, he did this wonderful uh, bronze of, of Christ breaking bread. Um, and what's interesting is he asked, the, he, was, he said one condition, because Walter was a uh, raised Orthodox Jew, but he became sort of atheist later in life. But anyway, he said, I'll, I'll do it under one condition, that I have a religious director. And um, the Archdiocese at that time gave him uh, Monsignor John Miller, who was just an incredible mind and um, knew, knew a great deal about church art and art history. So uh, Walter asked Monsignor, um, would it be all right if I did a sculpture of an Apollo Christ? And at the time it was considered, well, you know, no one would consider that, but Monsignor said, sure. So it, it brought about this whole other idea of um, sort of an, an early Christian model. Yeah. That um, this is how it was portrayed. And, uh, but Walter modeled it in a, you know, sort of naturalistic uh, fashion. And it was put in front of the cathedral until just a few years ago. Now it's hidden in some corner, you know, uh, hard to find. Mm. But um, so here we had, we, you know, the, these were the people that I, I started to look up to, you know, when I, um, when I was sort of very young in the ranks, you know, but they couldn't help me with the theological part because neither one of them were practicing Christians at all. They could help me artistically um, and were sometimes actually amused uh, in a way that I, I believed in these things. I said, do you really do believe in this, don't you? I said, yeah. Uh, I don't know how you can do it if you don't, but you know, it helped. Yeah, we, yeah, we live. It's like we live in a very re reductive age. It, it kind of when I, I imagine, yeah, kind of when I imagine what it was like for people in like the sixth and seventh century in Italy, you know, during the so-called Dark Ages, is that you know they had the remnants of a great culture still there but but civilization wow. had been reduced and and it's it's kind of interesting now because young people are now are so interested in older things old movies I, you know a antiques antiquity it's it's interesting so there's just not much new that that is um catching people's imagination there's just not much much there so no no they're they're they're, they're um and i think that that's um their imagination's a little lacking so I, I find out though that when i take my students away from copying i had a young lady here this summer um and uh i'm trying to think how old is maria she's not even in high school yet well but she loves to draw and I would have her do two things, draw from uh, life or what's in front of her, you know, and um, then in the afternoons, draw from memory. And um, here's proportions, just do, just do a, a figure from memory. And then I took it to another level, like, okay, if it's a standing figure, it's this many heads high. If it's a seated figure, it's this many heads. If it's a kneeling figure, it's this many heads. And these are based on early Da Vinci drawings. He shows you right then and there with this sort of figure, you know, with the arms out in a cruciform position, and then how, how, how big a, a kneeling figure is under that. And that's all you really need. So between standing, seated, and kneeling, Within and, and reversing figures and moving them a little bit, um, in in no time she had a seventeen figure composition, and then elevating some higher, lower. I said I want you to do a bilateral composition. She did a bilateral composition of um, Saint Joseph, the Blessed Mother, oh. and Christ Child. It was oh. just you know. Sort of like it, St. Joseph in Maya style. 
you know, it was wonderful. And this is from, this is from memory. All from memory. All from memory. Wow. Okay. (laughs) um, It's uh, it's possible. Yeah. Um, Yeah. If you're talented and you're good. Um, well, she was. She wasn't that she was. She she is talented. I don't want to take that. It's not that it came off realistically, but the fact that she, she could do it. And I think once you show people that this is not an impossibility, that these great masterpieces were not made with getting a studio with seventeen people in it. Yeah, they were from studies. They were put together in parts. Um, you had a lay mannequin with drapery on it for that pose. And then, you know, of course, we have the famous Durer praying hands. All those were parts of a of a much much larger composition. Do, do you do you th- uh, this is I'm I'm getting I'm getting in the weeds here. Uh, I had something else I wanted to ask you, but do you think that it's I kind of look at it as singing. Um, somebody can take a, a a lot of singing classes and have a a coach, but if you, if you don't have the natural ability, you're just, you're never going to be a Maria Callas, you know? Um, no, that's true. And, and I think you could be an adequate singer. And I think this was kind of why I ended up getting out of art studio and, and getting into art history, although I, because I love art history. I had, I had the will, I had the drive to be a good artist. And part of being in an atelier was that you're around a lot of other people and you're observing their work. And I was like, I just don't, I just don't have it. I don't have it. Um, I'll always, I'll be an adequate artist. You know, I was adequate, I would say, but I thought I'll never be a really good artist because there was just something, I don't know what it was. I just, I think I just did not have the natural ability, so. Well, there, there, there's natural ability. And then there's, to me, this is the difference between skill and talent. And, um, Someone like Maria Callas had skill and talent. Yes. All right. That was, that's really her, her trademark. You know, she would not go higher. She was always right on it. And, um, you know, but you realize in music, and this is what I'm, I'm, I've been studying and reintroducing into the visual arts. Music has this thing called solfeggio, solfeggio, right? And where, uh, A vocalist is trained vocal memory. And there was a a, a French author uh, named um, Bois Boudrin who put together a book, Training of the Memory for the Arts, because he felt that "Eh, if you could do this in music, why can't you do it in the visual arts? Well, in the music, sure, we could do it. And we got a, you know, a keyboard in front of us. He wrote an incredible book, Joseph, but he didn't put in any examples. He talks about them. So what I've been doing over the years is the book's already translated into English, so I don't have to uh, study French in order to get the the notes. But he said, well, if you do this series of exercises, it's going to help you to to do, you know, develop form memory. And they do. They really, really do. Um, But I geared them more toward... um, uh, building up to the figure, right, <clears throat> and um, and and how to put these blocks together so that you can start to move this stereometric figure as they always did in the Renaissance. You know, you could move it through space. You could do whatever you want with it, and then with then you can add anatomy to it. So, uh, but get your composition first, which I think is is what a lot of great composers did. You know, they did composition and then orchestration, All right? So we're doing, you know, orchestration. We don't have a composition in mind, but I think it's also to get back to what you're saying earlier that the difference between skill and talent, and um, to bring your either your 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 skill up to your talent. I mean, it's 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 a little tough when, and I. I used to recommend it to my students. You sh- should know which one you are because sometimes you could be more talented than skilled. Mm, yes. And you could be more, more skilled than talented. Try to get them to meet, but don't sacrifice talent if you don't have the 
skill. You should still do the best you can, you know. Yeah. Um, and don't try to feign it when you don't have the talent. It's all skill. And I think that's that's really a, a, that's a, uh, a, a problem we see a lot of, you know, where it's done beautifully, but it's just something's missing. And it, it's that that other that meeting of the two. OK, N -n now I'm getting ahead of myself, but but you kind of opened the you kind of opened the door for me here a little bit. Is it I, I kind of thought sometimes the the common denominator with the great artist was, I mean, they're a little crazy. This kind of goes back to Van Gogh with the suffering tortured artist. But yeah. um, there is, I think there is something almost to that. They're, they are able to channel a lot of whatever. And I always go back to Michelangelo. I, I, there's a chapter in my book about him. Is it, I mean, he was very much, I mean, I have a theory of why he was, a tortured artist, but he was able to channel that into his work. And I think at the time when <clears throat> I was I was uh, drawing and, and painting, I, I wasn't able to do that. I just I was I was rather restrained, and I and I saw a difference between female artists and and male artists. Is that a lot of the female artists? when we were all working together in the studio, they were like, oh, I find painting so relaxing. And it's, it's um, you know, it, it, it's, I don't want to say it was an art and craft or a hobby, but it was something that, I don't know, something they did. It wasn't something they lived. I'm making a vast generalization. It seemed like a lot of the male artists were, like I said, a little tortured. They remind me of, what was that painting? Um, uh is it bronzino um yeah bronzino with the triumph of, of venus with that that person in the background you know pulling their yeah. hair out and 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 I, I think this is why i got out of art studio because i would be in a painting i would have a painting and i would get up in the middle of the night and i would start working on it and i it, and i hated it, sure. it, it drew, yeah. and then the, where i was living at the time in berkeley um, there was a old fire, it was an old house and I had a fireplace. And sometimes I threw the painting, the canvas in there and burned it. And it was just, I go, oh. I, I can't deal with this. It's driving me crazy. And a lot of the other people, especially the male, I never met a female artist that was this way, but a lot of the male artists were that way. It was just, they got into a work and it was just like, that's all they ate, slept and drank was that work for the time. And it yeah. was... It was like, it's it was true. an obsession. It was, it was obsessive. And it, it is, like, it becomes an obsession. And I, I think again, to refer back to uh, another, uh, the woman artist, I was talking about Martha Erlbacher. Um, she would never get invited to all female shows or anything like that because she was doing this, these sort of epic forms, which she loved to do and she taught well. And, um, and they would, you know, the feminist would say, so you do, you know, your work is so male and she'd say, <laughs> yeah, I think like a guy. Okay. She just cut, yeah, I think like a guy, but she was a big devotee of Camille Paglia, who also teaches oh. here in Philadelphia. I, so I, we love, I love her. Well, you know, that question about um, the anima, animas conflict there between women artists and male artists and you see it, and I think I think it was during an interview with uh, Jordan Peterson, um, because the question came up, you know, about this difference between men and women. And, um, you know, somebody said, well, why don't we have a female Mozart or a female Michelangelo? And she said, for the same reason, you don't have a female Jack the Ripper. And everybody's... <laughs> That's uh oh, she she just did it. She just crossed the line there. But it's that kind of extreme that the um that the male does, no matter what form, good or bad, good or bad. You, you know, it's very rare to have uh, a female serial killer. Thank God. You know, um, although I think we're getting a little close there. <laughs> uh, yes. Yes. Um. What but, was that? But it is that kind of I do I have had I have had female students though to, who can be just as intense and um, that driven 
uh, but not as crazy as the guys. Uh, um, Camille Paglia said this, this is one of my favorite quotes of her, it's in my book. She wrote, a woman simply is, but a man must become. Masculinity is risky and elusive and is confirmed only by other men. I, I, I've always found that interesting. And I think it goes back to the Altaïe method of, of teaching where you have sort of a master and you have apprentices where th there's, a, because in the past, this was only men. This was only men. Women sure. did yeah. not take part in, until much, much more modern. Even in, in France, in during the uh, the uh, the uh, um, 18th and 19th century, you wouldn't have women um, involved with this. Bert Marisol well, was in it, France, but it had to be uh, kind of on her own. Because I think. it was business. I mean, that's the other thing. Guys had to go out and make a living. <laughs> oh, it's know, interesting. That, that, nobody, yeah. want, nobody wants to talk about that. The impressionists were a bunch of rich kids. Toulouse Lautrec's family owned the whole town. What's he got to go for at work for? So, mm -hmm. what did they do? They went to the the the, um, the academies and they studied landscape painting, portrait painting, biblical painting, historical painting. Well, I don't have to do that because I've got enough money to paint whatever I want. Yeah, you know, I mean, Van Gogh, wonderful. He had he had the NEA grant. Brother Theo sent him a check every month. So um, yeah, uh, uh, Gauguin made enough money to go live in the in the um, Tahiti. <laughs> Tahiti Tahiti for the rest of his life. Um, so they they all had Degas came from a nice wealthy family as well. Yeah, yeah, and uh, yeah, Monet had those beautiful gardens. So um, they they were really they they were amateurs. I won't call them hobbyists, but they were lovers of art, and they could do whatever they wanted. Yeah, it wasn't this starving thing that a lot of you know contemporary artists like to think. And um, again, I remember one one of the smartest things I ever heard in in uh, in my art school days was um, from a teacher who had studied with uh, Joseph Albers at Yale, and so she was you know pre well But I remember when the students saying something like, um, uh, "This is my first year in art school." And, he said something like, gee, I, I, I hope I can be as crazy as Van Gogh one day. And she stopped. She said, don't ever think that those paintings came out of any mental disorder. They were his sane side. Yeah. You never forgot that. That makes a lot of sense to me. Yeah. 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 That, and don't you think that that, that sort of break happened? Um, because uh, I, I think like when I, when I went to the Musée d'Orsay, that's one of my favorite museums in Paris. Oh, yeah. I like the way it's laid out is because it's been a long, long time. It's been over 20 years, but you, you kind of go in for people who've never been there and there's this sculpture area. And then you have, I can't remember the artist, the um, Romans of the Decadence, this huge, huge painting. Yes, yes, and, yes. And then it, it kind of breaks off and you kind of see where French art went. And you have the art, the academic art, like yeah. um, it probably be exemplified by like Bouguereau, who a lot of Catholics would know. And yeah. then you have it going in the other direction with the Impressionists. And people like Bouguereau were still of the academy. They were of the Altaïe. That's the way they trained. And it's that very classical academic, you know, work. Yeah. I'm um, doing commissions and he's doing, he's doing commissions. And then you have Impressionism, which was the plain air, yeah. which is so different. And then if you follow like Clement Greenberg, which is that's the way I was trained in art history, is yeah. that every, he's an art historian and every yeah. all art was sort of this uh, journey towards abstraction, towards like nihilism, you know? Yes. And um, I, I don't agree with that, but because- Oh, no, no. I, uh, I was very strange. I was trained that way too. Yeah, I was very strange, Anthony. Because when I was at, at Berkeley and I was studying art history, and one of my professors was T.J. Clark, who was this famous Marxist, you know, uh, theorician, and he was very much into uh, impressionism and the, the sort of the Clement Greenberg style. The looking everything went to abstraction, and I was interested. I was interested in academic art, Bouguereau, and very much 
the pre-Raphaelites, who at that time in the late 80s and early oh, 90s, absolutely. No. I mean, nobody cared about. They were in the basement of museums. And the things have really sure. changed radically because now it, there's a big appreciation. Then it was probably like Christopher Wood, who was more uh, a writer. Well, he came from a, an art a collecting uh, auction uh, background, but nobody was writing about that type of work then no but yeah. let alone doing it i mean you were would, would be really considered bourgeois and out of it if you were interested in oh sure i lost a lot of friends over it when i started uh, you know they they uh because i wasn't i have to i have to confess i was not doing this before i got the fulbright my fulbright was based on um things like um beyond garden hose for line drawing i mean i was literally doing things like rearranging a dump site and photographing it okay i was my drawing what drawing i who says a drawing has to be done with you know pencil and a manufactured size piece of paper how about if i tear up the piece of paper and glue it back together again that's it and no it's on the floor why does the drawing have to be hung well the teachers loved it I couldn't, I just wanted somebody to get me and shake me and say, well, you stop it. And I didn't because it just kept going. And um, yeah, I'll, I'll come out and say, it. I was good at it, whatever it was, but I was good at it. And uh, I remember one critique, I, I had to sign up for drawing class and it was my last year in teacher I, I said well i'm not coming come, come to class you know i'm not going to draw from life or anything like that so suppose we meet every couple of weeks and i'll show you what i'm doing he said fine and one day we were sitting there joseph and he started to talk about jewish mysticism and the kabbalah mm, okay I'm, I'm a catholic boy from northeast philadelphia i don't know what that means and i thought one of us is really off here and um, I, based on that kind of work, I, I got this summer scholarship to uh, the School of Painting and Sculpture in Skowhegan, Maine. Wow. And while there, there's this little cabin in the woods and they had a hi-fi, you know, and old records and would go up there at night and, you know, drink beer or whatever and, 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 and put the, the records on. But I would go up in the middle of the afternoon because I found this stack of 78s. And in that pile of 78s was this one in particular, because you know, it took eight 78s to make one complete whatever. It happened to be um, the Benedictus from Bach's Mass in B minor, which I had never heard. And I thought, I'm gonna play it. And I started to play it and it was, it's, everything started coming back. And, you know, having been always with the Latin mass my entire life up until high school, uh, you get to the Benedictus and all of a sudden the idea of words, notes and meaning came together. And it sort of reintroduced me to content and narrative content and my longing for it and how missing it was for my work. So um, I came back from that trip and I said, I, I can't do this anymore. Meantime, I had already used those works to apply for the Fulbright. And I won. So I thought, now what am I going to do? Seriously, because I... Uh, Did you I, turn... I, I, okay. Did you turn I, towards more figurative art at that point? Or oh, absolutely, it... absolutely. And I got there and I went to the, the, the head of the Fulbrights over there and I said, in Rome, and I said, look, I'm, that whole proposal I made and I went on, I felt like I had to be honest. I said, I'm not gonna be doing any of that stuff. And the woman said, it's your year to study. You do what you want. And I went off to Florence and that was that, you know. Wow. So, wow. Um, and so that that year was an entire year of relearning and looking and and mostly autodidactic. There was I, I went to the the Academia Belli Arti. I, I last I didn't last there too long mainly because 
once the teacher found out that I was an American, he said, why are you doing these, you know, figures for, you should be doing neon, the plexiglass. I said, I left that for this. So I had to leave and just kind of, I thought, just go to museums and churches and draw. And that's what I did. Wow. Wow. And the so, figurative for people at, um, at home, that figurative art is like, you know, over your shoulder that it looks like almost like Michelangelo's igneous die. I know. Uh, and yeah. on the on the Sistine, so that's figurative art. It's a figure. It's um, it's a form. Where as yeah. abstract is just mother well or whatever you know, just uh, uh, non representational. So I've got just representational, non representational because and I again was taught his art history like you were in that it you realize in hindsight that. You know, they could be talking about the the Giotto um, uh, betrayal of Judas, and but they're not talking about the betrayal of Judas. They're getting there with uh, the, uh, the the spears, and they they're this and the shapes and the size and the and the negative positive shape and the exchange, and it goes right to Pollock. No, yeah. you don't have to even stop a little bit. So the way we were taught was. Well, here's Poussin. You see how geometric Poussin is? Now, when we get to Cezanne, <laughs> see, and then yes. they try to retrofit. It's like, if, see, if the mean old Catholic church weren't so horrible, Poussin could have been painting like Cezanne, but they made him, they forced him, they put a gun to his head to paint like this, those terrible assumption paintings he did. He could have been another Cezanne. Now, Cezanne, because of this or that, he could have been Mondrian. He didn't have to paint those stupid apples over and over again, but we needed him to get to Mondrian. So we were taught the same exact way, all French formalism. Yeah. And you start to interpret these, you know, someone like Caravaggio like that, you know, oh, let's talk about Caravaggio and black shit. Don't, yeah, let's forget St. Ignatius of Loyola and the spiritual exercises who was there in Rome at the same time. And there, at least... Vitkover will admit that figures like Ignatius of Loyola and uh, St. Philip Neri were in Rome during that time and were having these meetings. Yeah. And, and did, did Caravaggio and the other Tenebristi ever attend them? You know, no, we want to paint him as a bad, oh, he's a murderer, he's this, he's that. That didn't happen. Yeah, he did fatally wound somebody who died as a result. But Caravaggio got stabbed too. It's just that he recovered. Yeah. So art history likes to eliminate all those all those things. Yeah. After after having to listen to that for years, I I started to just hate art. And then what I write yeah. about this in my book is where because you didn't discuss beauty, and I think I was that's what I loved. And and sure. um, I and started reason. getting into pop culture very much because especially in I don't want to scandalize anybody. But especially in the gay male community, you still had the obsession with the figurative and the female and the male body. And yeah. um, that's why I got, that's where I found beauty. And it was sort of weird is that um, that's where I ended up well, going. And, well, and, uh, Camille Paglia talks about that. I, in, yeah. Not in, in something where she talked about, you know, how that was the only place still reserved for an aesthetic. Yes. And how sad that is in a way that yes. it was just, you know, uh, homocentric concentrations there because it wasn't happening in feminism. They weren't really painting beautiful women. That was considered a male thing. How dare you, you know, you know, so let's, uh, I mean, I, I had one student who at, at the academy, she did um, a series of paintings and she won a travel scholarship for it. She did a series of portraits. I don't know if they're portraits. They're, they were paintings of women who had gone through mastectomies. Wow. And she only did the upper torso. Wow. And I had to just go, can't say a word, because you're not allowed to critique that. That's part of the problem. We're not allowed to critique that kind of work anymore. Right. My issue was it not that she didn't have sympathy or empathy for these women. None of them had a head. None of no. them, not one of them had, they were all the neck, from the neck down. So these are just paintings of somebody's scarred mastectomy. They're not people. Wow. No faces. So 
she dehumanized them in a way. Very much. It's yeah. Yeah, pretty much. So um, there, there's again, that's why I could understand why that aesthetic is was was strong. At least it was for a while. Now, and I saw this happening in in art school. If you're a woman, it must be you must deal with a feminist issue. If you're perceived as having some same sex attraction, you better paint or sculpt about it or write about it or perform about it. You can't just, you know, if you're uh, black, you've got to be, and I've dealt with students who come to me saying, you know, it's, it's as if I'm not allowed to like this. <laughs> How do I, what do well, I do? Well, that, you know, uh, why, yeah. why do I have to do black Afro, Afro American art? I have a, 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 an African American student right now who's dealing with this. He loves the aesthetic of, of you know, sort of Greco-Roman culture, for, for lack of a better term. Oh, nice. And he has to answer to this all the time. Oh, yeah, yeah, So, um, but that's, that's unfortunately where we are. So it, it's best that, you know, if we, if we do start up these ateliers, and I, I think they will be happening more and more. We need a good, strong, a few good, strong Catholic ones, though. And I don't say Catholic just because of, of my, but... Like right now I'm dealing with another group in the Midwest. They, they'd like me to help them out and I will as best I can. And I know they're they're. I said, well, what is your religious affiliation? And, and one of the guys said, well, I, I tithe with the Methodists and the Mormons. Okay, where are we gonna go from here? You know, I, one half of you doesn't even believe in the Trinity. So, how we talk, we got it, but I'm trying, I, I, I spoke with uh, uh, one of my, my clients, a, a Monsignor, and I said, I'm going to try to take this on as perhaps a form of evangelization, you know, not heavy hitting, but okay, if we're going to deal with these themes, let's talk about them in terms of theology, if we can, if they are scriptural, you know, if they're Old Testament, New Testament, maybe, maybe there's an angle. Maybe those the because they admire the the art from the Catholic Church. That's that's no doubt about that. That's what's that's what's really pulling them into this. The beauty of what we did. And I, yeah. it, still holds, it still holds to be true. So that's what they're attracted to. Yeah, I th I think the struggle. Because one of the things I wrote in my book is I said, there's really no great gay artists anymore. And I, 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 people take umbrage with me. But I mean, if you look at Michelangelo, even like a, a, a Joseph Leyendecker, the illustrator, even someone like yeah. Robert Bullthorpe, I think that uh, we're all raised in a religious background. I know Robert Bullthorpe was, was raised Catholic for, for a fact. Is it, um, there, I think there was a struggle with their with their desires and i think the greatness of the art was a i don't want to say result but it 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 originated i think from that 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 inner torment that they had going on and i think i think robert maplethorpe was a tipping point because you could see some of the some of the greatness in his work and then it just it slid it slid into pornography. It slid into yeah. something very ugly. And um, yeah. since then, it's yeah, since then, like you said, there's just nothing great because no. it's all becomes political. And if you identify, if your identity and it, it's, no. it's not interesting art and politics and art that's no. trying to make a point. I know it's, it's so... It's so anti-modern to say art can be just beautiful. It can just be something to beautiful and gaze on. You know, now it has to be, sure. it has to, has some meaning. I want to get into that too. Which... <laughs> yeah, it, uh, and, and it has to make a political statement. And, um, and when students are presented that kind of uh, material in their classes by their teachers, like I had one student, I was still working at the school in Florence uh, the end of 2019. And he started to write to me and uh, I didn't know who he was. And he said, when are you coming back? Um, I, I, it's been recommended that I meet you and talk to you. And I said, well, where are you? Who are you? What are you doing? And he told me he was at the Academy of Art here. And um, 
I said, well, what's your schedule like? Well, when, when I chaired the department there, Joe, it was 10 classes a week, morning and afternoon, all in the studio, all with the model, right? And he wrote back and said, well, I'm off Mondays. I got a half day Tuesday, full day Wednesday, half day Thursday. And I, I said, oh, you're part time. He said, oh, no, that's full time. Oh, that's full time. And that's in, and, and plus they added liberal arts. So he's taking liberal arts classes. So I came back, we met and um, I said, how are you doing? He said, ah, not so good. I, I, I think I have to leave. I can't, I can't take it. I can't study what I want to study. And I said, well, what are you doing in, in um, I called it English literature. That's what we used to call it. And he said, oh, it's just literature. I said, well, what book are you doing? Or oh, we're not doing a book. I said, well, what are you studying? He said, well, and this is the first day of class. The teacher came in and said, hi, my name is so-and-so. I'm a, a single mom lesbian with a son. Mm -hmm. That's not literature. And that's nobody's business. I would have mm -hmm. fired her on the spot if I were the dean. But of course, then you get sued. No, I'm not, uh, I'm not firing you because you, you had to come out to your students. That's not teaching. That's dumping. So, and I said, well, what are you reading in this in single mom lesbian class? He said, we're reading poetry written by her African-American lesbian poet friends. Oh. Unpublished. So here's this guy, you know, single straight white male. He's not allowed to criticize this stuff. He's going to be called homophobic, racist, and everything else. And his teachers start to write letters to his parents saying, you know, your son's not participating because he's living at home. That would get him out of school. Yeah, he didn't say anything, but just his presence. Uh, and, and so when you're doing that in these art schools, you know, I just nail the door shut. They're done. They're, they're, they can't come back from all this. They, they've gone too far, which is great because now we can start doing more and bigger and better ateliers. Not bigger. I think small is better, to be honest with you. Small, intimate. You, um, ha yeah. you have to move outside. I don't, and I don't mean academy in the French. You have to move outside the academy. The, I think the yes. whole hope for art is like what you're talking about, just apprenticeship and uh, you don't have to have a degree, uh, a meaning, a meaning. Oh, degree. absolutely not. No, I've never, I've Master never won a commission or even gotten a teaching job based on no, no one says to me, what was your terminal degree? You know, <laughs> I mean, I, I don't have an MFA. I never get one. I don't want, I, you know, what for? I hope so, we're swing. Yeah, I hope we're swinging back to where, uh, to where you know, it's not which school you attended, what university, uh, but who you studied under. Like, and that's the way it used to be. I sure. studied under so and so. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. And um, but I, I I think, and I'm meeting more and more young people that are taking this sort of workshop or whatever with this person, and um, like this young man I was just talking about. He studies with me. He's studying with another uh, sculptor in Maryland, uh, taking classes over here. And I, I think that's where we're going. And I'm, I'm excited by that because these, these schools, as non-academic as they like to think they are, they are the established academy. Yeah. They are the establishment. As much as anti-establishment they'd like to be or think they are, they're not at all. Not at no. all. No, no. Uh, if you have time, I wanted to talk a little bit about the Reformation liturgy. Do you have time? Sure. Okay. Um, a little bit. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. It, it does involve church art and architecture. Yes, really yes, yes. Um, somebody that I'm, I'm in, I, I've always liked, is, I think he's out of fashion, was the historian Kenneth Clark. And he wrote these big tomes, Civilization and Romanticism. Oh, yeah. And something he wrote in uh, the book Civilization, he wrote, after the Reformation, a new civilization was created. It was a civilization not of the image, but of the word. I always thought that was really interesting. And it, it made me think of um, 
a big a, a book that was influ- the big influence on me when I was in college was um, uh, Tom Wolfe's book, The Painted Word. Oh yes. yes, and it was it was all it was it was all about the pretension of modern art. We, it wasn't just like you could look at it, you know, art that you could look at and appreciate was so bourgeois. And, you know, uh, to to understand, you know, modern art, you had to have this discourse, you know. And, you know, it goes back to all this stuff that was being shoved down my throat at the time, like Foucault and, and Der- Derrida. And, I just, and um, so you had to you had to discuss the art. And it's this reminds me of the liturgy because Protestant liturgy and high, you know, Roman Catholic <laughs> liturgy, um, Protestant liturgy, even Protestantism in general is about the word. It's very word focused. Absolutely. Yeah, and yes. then and then as a result of the Reforma- the Reformation, not everywhere, but certainly in England and in France you had this wholesale destruction of, of, of art, of religious yeah. art. And I'm, I'm trying to tie this all in <laughs> together in my mind. It's getting- No, no, no. <laughs> I hope, yeah, I hope you know where I'm going. But, and then- um, I know where you're going. Okay. I know where you're going. It, it, so, it's important because it is a major shift from the image to the word. And one that- um, you know, again, this is another period for us in, in Catholic art history that the art historians have manipulated into as if, you know, the, the artists of the high Renaissance were, you know, they were just hanging out at a cafe in front of, you know, the Pantheon and said, you know, I think I'm getting tired of this high, high Renaissance thing. You know, like, I'm, I'm thinking of going manners. How about you? It didn't happen that way. <laughs> what happened was Protestantism. And it is the church of the, our work at that period really is a very nervous work. And the only book that I've ever found, Joseph, if you can find it, grab it. It's by Sir Anthony Blunt, another great art historian, right? Uh, who, who essentially I went to jail for being a spy, but uh, it's another story. He wrote a book called Artistic Theory in Italy from 1450 to 1600. And what art historians, just like they leave out St. Ignatius of Loyola and um, St. Philip Neri during the uh, Counter-Reformation, they leave out Trent and its response to, um, here their art's being vandalized, they're Their stained glass windows are are being smashed. Their statues are being turned over by the Protestant Reformation. What are we going to do? So the recommendation in in Trent was perhaps we've gone a little too far with this naturalistic representation. Perhaps revisiting the, the mystical of the Gothic. We've lost the mystical here. So... If I'm an artist and I've got, I'm nervous now about how am I going to handle this, and we see with every single mannerist a change in proportions, Pontormo, Fiorentino Rosso, El Greco, absolute master at this, but he already had a foot in the door because he understood that kind of manipulation of, of form through the for the Byzantine icon. Okay, space, there's no reciprocity in in mannerist space whereas in the renaissance an equal cube of volume equals a a cubic foot of of void there's reciprocity there not that way light is inconsistent space is inconsistent form is inconsistent and it it wasn't until counter-reformation that we went back to that more naturalistic form right 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 it's almost like saying Well, if you didn't like the flesh of the Renaissance, you're really not going to like the muscle of the Baroque. If they had written it in those terms, people like you and I would have gotten that right away. Yeah. Right? But they made it all about style. Yes. Yes, yes. And um, I I love El Greco. Yeah, there's just something. Yeah, yeah, there's just 
an asceticism to his figures. They look emaciated. They look um, suffering. They yeah. look, um, yeah, there's something about it. compared. Well, well he's Spanish um, compared to like Italian, like Parmigianino, who I can't stand the Madonna of the long neck, the sensuality and, and um, uh, the Madonna. That's, I know, but here's the thing. She's I, not really the Madonna of the long neck. She's Pilar, and the art historians conveniently, you know, she's Our Lady of the Column, La Colonna, which, of course, in Spanish, you know, a very strong Catholic name is Pilar. We don't have it so much in the other languages, but uh, that's who, who she supposedly represents. Um, I just don't think he's as masterful as the other Mannerists, and that's based on, that's based on one word in, in Vasari. When Vasari is talking about Fiorentino Rosso in, in Pontormo, and he said they had un certo maniera, and are, you know here here we've got these Kenneth Clark types. That's it, Manier, That means mannerist. That's a mannerist thing, and they made a whole period devoted to it instead of saying there are certain books that are coming out about Michelangelo and invention during the Reformation period. But to go back to that thing of going from image to word, I have one uh, non-Catholic commission. It's probably my best to tell you the truth, commission uh, that I've done. And it was for a Presbyterian church, which was highly unusual because Presbyterians are not big on, on figures or anything like that in their churches. But this little chapel, in Bryn Mawr, Pennsylvania, already had some things. It's the Catherine Pugh Memorial Chapel. And they asked me to do reliefs for this Reredos that they were had designed. And uh, I met with the uh, pastor at the time, Dr. Watermuller, great guy. And again, fantastic. They're, they're incredible with constructing homilies. Uh, their, their words are beautiful. And, um, so when he said the sacraments, I said, oh, you want seven panels? I said, seven? There's no seven sacraments. There's only two. <laughs> and he, he slammed his hand on, he slammed his hand on what I call the altar by accident. He said, there's only two. Baptism and Eucharist held together by the word. Right. And I went, oh, that's, that's why you don't have a tabernacle in the middle. You put your podium in the middle. It's the word. So I did the baptism of Christ, the Sermon on the Mount, and um, Christ of Tiberius. That's one thing. They, they did let me get away with that because I didn't want to go. This is on the artistic side. I didn't want to go from an exterior scene, baptism, uh, exterior scene, um, uh, Sermon on the Mount, to an interior scene, Last Supper. So I said, can I do a post um post-resurrection Eucharist and he said like what I said um Christ of Tiberius he said fine so I got to do all three panels but it was an interesting journey going from this idea of the word to the image and then back to the word again uh and it it, it I think it, we all learned from it because that's when some were asking well how high is this relief going to be I said, what do you mean? Well, will there be any parts extending? Like, you know, the air can go around them. I said, well, I could do, you know, I can make them as high or low if you want. I can, you know, just, sort of, I'm, I'm thinking Ghiberti, right? I'm going, well, we've got, you know, um, alto, medio, basso, and schiacciato. Okay, we can go, you know, all four voices, as it were. And, um, I said, oh, well, we're going to have to think about that. And I said, and I knew where they were going. You know, sort of, if it's completely in the round, then it becomes an idol. And I said, look, I'm Catholic. I'm going to go straight to hell. So don't worry about that. But <laughs> I need to know, in terms of the Presbyterian church or the Reformed church, how thick does it get before it's an idol? One-eighth round, three-quarters, seven-eighths, two-thirds. What, you know, what is it that makes it go from you know dimensional to an idol and they went home they thought about it and they said you know 
we went over Calvin, we've gone over everything. We can't find anything like that. Oh, so this was some form of self-imposed iconoclasticism based on what? Dislike for the church? You know, and it, it's still, you know, uh, to, to talk about this and going back to, to the, uh, the iCloud behind you, Joseph, and different students, I had a very, 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 very talented, one of the most talented students and skilled uh, when I was um, teaching. He could paint, sculpt, draw, do it all. I had him both in graduate and undergrad, uh, both in undergraduate and graduate school at the New York Academy. He was Greek Orthodox, an incredibly talented sculptor and painter. He lamented the fact that he could not make a contribution to his church at all, at all, unless he painted in, in Greek Orthodox icon style, which he didn't want to do. He constantly blamed 14, uh, 1543. If you had come and saved us, I'm serious. This was a, if you had come and saved us, Greek Greece was on the verge. Byzantium was on the verge of a Western turnover. They were going to accept the Renaissance and everything else, and figures and sculpture. And but you guys didn't come and save us, and I can't get to do this. And he never got over it. It's a shame. He tried. He tried, but, and I'm not saying he should have converted, not, not at all, but I think he still would have been able, uh, given his knowledge of, of the faith and his abilities, he could have done commissions for the Catholic Church. Um, instead, he just decided to, to uh, go back home and, and, and teach anatomy and make models of things and mm. never did anything in terms of sacred art again. There's a lot of... Yeah, I have a, I have a friend, um, Shane Swenson. There's some really interesting things being done in iconography right now that yeah. are are traditional, but uh, you know are taking it in a different direction. You know, yeah. so I mean, there is I think there is space there for for innovation and uh, he he's he's really a, he's he's definitely sort of a Michelangelo John Bologna kind of guy, and I don't know if they would go for that. Okay. And I'm not talking about. Uh, uh, flesh and nudity or any of that, you know, because he could do drapery as well. But it's just that sort of, here we go again, that sensual aspect. And he was, a, you know, a good flesh modeler that would have been very, very, you know, that's one thing that, that astounded me when I first got to Italy, I had to go to Rome first. And I just started to walk around and look at things. And by the time I got to um, the Vatican, I didn't know whether I was so overwhelmed by it. I, I really didn't know whether to, to cry or throw up. And one thing was for sure, whatever I was raised, it wasn't this. This is too beautiful. It's too joyous. It's too sensual. Yes. All those things. I realized just that what Protestantism had done to the Catholic Church in the United States, where we didn't have anything like that. No. And, and the Catholic, this is where I want to get into it a little bit with you. And the Catholic Church to itself, because I, I was born in 1969. So that okay. was when the, oh the, the Novus Ordo was instituted. Yeah. And um, so I'm kind of like these six and seventh century romans you know observing high culture but realizing that it's gone because people don't realize especially people that are younger than than i is that um we had grand architectural churches if you go to the cities like me at san francisco so we have <laughs> we have saint peter and paul which was you know, built by Italian immigrants, and it's it is lush. It's gorgeous. Yeah. it's a lot of marble and a lot of stone, and and then we have Saint Dominic, yeah. uh, which is the Dominican, which is much more French and Gothic, and but but beautiful nonetheless. And but I didn't grow up. Most most people of my generation, we grew up in suburbia, and we grew up in very ugly churches. Um, 
and not to down John Paul II, but something like Nova Huta, you know, from from Poland, just yeah. ugly and very stripped down. And if there had been, um, if it was an older church, older church building, um, it was stripped. It was stripped. Stuff was taken stripped. down. Yeah. And uh, the whole focus, you know, if the high altar was there, most of the time they were just pulled out. And then, out. You, yeah, and then a, 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 a table, I'm not going to call it an altar, a table. No, was, it's a table. Yeah, a table was put out front. And then as a teenager, I was raised in a very 1970s church, which was, so you never had anything of the past. You had a, a church in the round or theater in the round. And um, no, no art. And what art was there was ugly. So, um, yeah, I kind of have this theory. This is kind of a, a later uh, manifestation of the Protestant, uh, 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 the Protestant Reformation, where in the Novus Ordo you had this focus on the word, the vernacular, and um, any kind of beauty whether from the Latin or from the incense or the Gregorian chant, these are very fundamental to the mass. Um, these were all taken away. The, the beauty yes. and art, art as a consequence was removed. There has been no great, there was no great no. liturgical art of the 70s and the 80s. And then in the 90s, you see it turning oh, God, around. No. no. Yeah, you see it turning around because of it the- started yeah, efforts of people like you. Yeah, it, it's one. It's one of the laments of of my uh, career. Not that I should have any, because I think I've been very, very, very blessed and fortunate to to get what I got. But I came back completely equipped, and the fact that I had to wait until I was fifty years old to to do something like a life size bronze saint when I was capable at 30. And when I look at all, the, I, I, I just came back saying, I'm gonna do it whether the church wants it or not. That's all. And I kept doing it and I kept doing it and kept doing it. But um, yeah, we lost a lot of, we probably lost a lot of people who were quite capable and willing to do it. And this is why we have to start training and talking to seminarians now. When we think that our priests especially during that time, my generation, the boomers, they kill, they're the ones that killed it. All right. Exactly. They're the ones that, are, you know, uh, when, whenever I see that kind of stuff happen, I say, okay, let me ask. He's a boomer, right? Yeah. How did you know? I said, because my generation is the one that did this. And um, you're 1969. I, that's when I had to sort of say, okay, I, I, I don't even know what to do at mass anymore. There was no implementation. You know, I was trained as an altar boy. We call them acolytes, right? right. And we were, we were not trained by priests, which I still don't understand why, Father, where were you? We were trained by nuns who were in habits. On the other side of the altar rail, okay? Because they, they were not allowed in the sanctuary area. So she's pointing and hollering, of course, you know. <laughs> you know, uh, uh, and yes, I was, uh, Sister Miriam Xavier did slap me and call me a clown on the altar of God, but I didn't care. I, you know, I wanted to be an altar boy, clown on the altar of God. Uh, but anyway, um, we did exactly what we were told to do and we wanted to do it because I walked onto into that sanctuary that morning and saw, I was in awe, you know, here's these great marble columns and this life-size crucifix in beautiful white Carrara marble. Um, and here's the five steps going up, you know, to the high altar because, you know, you, there's an, always an uneven number. And because of my height, um, I was one of the 10 torch bearers, you know, for uh, the, the high masses. And, and again, you realize the design 
in those days was typically cruciform. And when did that come in and how did it come in? We're not, we're not putting it together that communion in the hand and the radial church destroyed that. Yes. So now you've got, you know, you almost make excuses for extraordinary ministers. Um, and when I talk, you know, give lectures on church design, I talk about the radial pattern in, in, in terms of not just gross abuse, but also um, the misuse of the so-called extraordinary uh, minister. You don't need them. They're extraordinary. And um, it's been used politically again. Of course, we know that. Uh, but the thing is that the church in the round, you know, if you want to, the, the architects, usually bad ones, will say something. Well, you know, the church has always had church. No, you had Sa Santo Stefano Rotondo in Rome, third century. What <laughs> was the liturgical form then? You didn't get to communion, dude. No. It never happened that way. You couldn't receive every Sunday. You certainly couldn't receive on the hand. Um, and so the mass went on for hours in that form. Of course, it could be done in the round. But I call it this like they always want to go back to, you know, the third or fourth century. I call it catacomb boy, catacomb girl. Well, the church used to. Yes, under different pretexts, a whole different mass. Once. Um, once communion was, you know, given to the, to the age of reasons, that's when it really started to change. And but it was fine. We've got this wonderful long nave, so you can process up, um, and then divide and go on either side. You, you had either one or two priests, sometimes four if it was a, a admit, you know, uh, um, going to all the communicants, and um, that all changed. That all changed with, uh, we, I walked in one Sunday and stunned. You know, what? Why, why is Mr. Snyder on the altar? He's not supposed to be there. And then somebody comes up and, and you know, polyester slaps and starts reading. <laughs> we were not told, just we were not told this was going to happen. People walked out. I know. People walked out and some of them never went back. I, so, when I, um, yeah. I, I used to have a, a brick and mortar store uh, where I sold, you know, Italian imports. I did a lot of r religious goods and I had a, and I missed all this. And there was an older gentleman that came in my store and he said, I went to this. So it was one of the most stripped down uh, churches in our area. And he said, I showed up for mass one day and the statues were literally in the dumpster. That's how violent. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah. On the streets, on the streets. I live across the street from, what used to be would have been my parish had uh, it not been torn down in 1972 and everything was put on the street stations of the cross all this and they were gorgeous all gone all gone and um yeah it was just uh it happens i'm i'm probably going to see more of it happen here in philadelphia yeah. because they're 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 consol they're consolidating parishes, and that's well, just they're because they're consolidating. But they're also doing stupid, stupid things like, "Let's get rid of devotions." Are you serious? Yeah, let's get rid of devotions. And then, of course, with the whole COVID thing, my parish, or what was a parish, uh, uh, has been reduced to a worship site only. Uh, there's no priests on hand. They will not fill the holy water fonts at all due to COVID. Come on. How many people do we know, you know, not, e not even during the height of AIDS did you do that? It's not. Like, oh my God, I'm going to touch the water and get COVID and die. It's ridiculous. Ridiculous. So um, we used to have exposition of the Blessed Sacrament every day. And I could go there. Not anymore. It's been withdrawn because we don't want to attract people. So we're, we're really kind of... On, on part, some levels, yeah. you know, going down. But part of, I, I keep thinking yeah. it's going to come back. And I love seeing churches, like there's some in Philadelphia, and I walk in and everything's intact, and I say, oh, they were too poor to renovate. That's wonderful. Too poor yeah. to renovate. 
Yeah, I, I trace all this back, I mean, to postmodernism. So, I mean, postmodernism certainly affected the arts. And sure. I'd say this sort of deconstruction was this sort of the act of deconstruction was performed on the liturgy as well. I mean, I see the Novus Sordo yes. as a, as a, as a, re, I mean, I'm no longer Catholic anymore. So I guess I can say this stuff. Yeah, I, I see the Novus Sordo yeah. as a postmodern deconstructive experiment. Yeah. So, sorry, you're, guys. You're, no, you're Roman Orthodox right now. Uh, uh, yeah, Russian I, Orthodox. Right? Russian Orthodox. Yeah. See, Russian Orthodoxy yeah. never had this lobotomy performed on it, like like no. uh, like Roman Catholicism. This violent. Well, it never had a Reformation, um, and it never had this other this violent heaving in the 1960s. And it sure it certainly had its share of carnage. It had Russia. It has a very violent. Uh, history including what no 1917 with the revolution but for sure, uh, sure it just it never and the art too has remained rather pure although i don't find it static at all or although a lot of people do i mean because this no is no if if i were yeah i i the 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 russian school of iconography i think allowed allowed different artists, not because they were special or anything, but allowed their artists to make an interpretation of, of the physical parts, of the fleshy parts, that I think is really, it's in a more naturalistic way. You don't have, you're not like the Greek Orthodox, which you must do it exactly like this drawing, or it's not going to be sacred, it's not going to be holy, and you're not going to get the blessing and go away, okay? Uh, and plus, um, the Russian Orthodox are open, very, very much more open to other artists where I'm not born Russian, I'm not raised Russian Orthodox, but I'd like to do an icon and they'd probably say, okay. Yes. Whereas the Greeks, if you're not Greek and you don't speak Greek, I know Greek Orthodox and they, 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 you are not allowed to touch it. You're not allowed, you know. So they're very, what I call ethnocentric. The Russian Orthodox that I know here are not, not ethnocentric at all. No, no. This this so, icon here is of the royal martyrs. So this is a fairly new yes. icon, and it, and it goes in different directions that that previous icons hadn't 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 done. And I think so one I, of the I, 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 what's that? What's that? I'm sorry, you. It, it got static there, but I have a question for you. Oh, go ahead. Because it's, it's one thing that bothers me, speaking of icon type painting, is the sort of pseudo Catholic icon where you take a photo of Padre Pio and you copy the photo just like the photo or St. John of Mola and you paint a yellow ochre background and you think that that's an icon painting in I know. I, I just, of, yeah, I just wrote something about that. It's, it's kitsch and it's something, oh yeah, it it's something odd that you have in, and I, some, some Russian Orthodox have corrected me and say that this has made some inroads, but you especially see it in Roman Catholicism where yes. it's, um, I, I, I don't know if it has to do where the market and religion have met and it's something that they easily mass produce and it looks sacred, but it also looks kitschy. And I, I think it, and you said something and I wanted to hit on it, but but uh, my mind went somewhere else, is you talked about taste. And and where taste wow. came up with me, and I wanted you to address this too, is like the, the Vatican nativities that have been so controversial lately. Um, there was one a couple of years ago, it was sort of like Neapolitan, but it had like a new, yeah. a new figure. It kind of looked like Jeff Koons' work. It just, I, I don't think there, there was a taste level there. And then you had later this sort of, uh, uh, what was it? It was kind of a terracotta, primitive. Yeah. And, and people think of taste sometimes as being something sort of snobbish, you know, where I think taste is just uh, the ability to discern good art and bad art. Uh, you know, good cuisine, bad cuisine. And I think that's been lost a bit. I mean, in the Catholic general public, but certainly in the clergy, 
I mean, if you look some of the vestments they're wearing, they don't have taste. Yeah. <laughs> I would like to get a job in a seminary, not just teach church art and architecture, but then there'd be another department for um, just something like material. And I'd have a cattle prod or a taser and I'd line the seminarians up and I'd say, okay, this is marble. This is from Micah. This is contact paper. Scramble <laughs> them up. Okay, which one's marble? Eh. No, try again. Which one's marble? Eh. Try again. Okay, this is this is silk. This is linen. Linen. This is burlap. Scramble them up and make them touch. You know, they don't know. And here, these guys, you got to sit and say, look, one day, you may be pastor of a church that it was built. In the, in the in 1820, it's worth millions and millions and millions of art and architecture. How do you maintain it? Or you may luckily be the one who's got to build a church from scratch. This is a plan. This is an elevation. This is a section. What? Yeah, I've I've sat on committees to, where you know the, you know the, the 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 religious is looking over uh, a plan of the of the pew layout, what am I looking at? And you said, well, it's kind of like a bird's eye view. You're looking down, makes no sense to me. And they're kind of snobby about it. As some are really good. Like for example, I have to say, you know, his end is Cardinal Burke. You can show him drawings. You can show him plans, elevations. He can read it. I don't know where he got that from, but he knows how to do it. He has taste. And, uh, he has taste and he also is very, very humble about it and say, you know, uh, Mr. Visco, if you wouldn't mind, you know, if I might suggest, and he's usually a, right on, that's an excellent, yes, why didn't I think of that? So, but he's rare. Yeah, I think he's a rare. lot, I think all of this a bad art in the church, I think a lot of it is downstream from the liturgy. And I think when the liturgy just went sloppy, and in my era, it went folk, you know, it went folk mass, you oh, know, it went, it went yes. full guitar, hold hands, yes. uh, rainbow stoles, all that stuff. So when it, uh, Jonathan Livingston Siegel, when it went, oh. when, it, when it did that, oh yeah, when it did that, the St. Louis Jesuits, when it did that, when I think people lost any sense of the sacred for the space and for the body of Christ, because I see this as, you know, a Novus Ordo Catholic, well, I was a TLM Catholic, but then going into Russian Orthodoxy and people walk in and it's a sacred space and it's, it's the architecture is totally different. It's darker, it's, it's a lot of candles, no electric candles. Um, you know, there's the smell of oil and incense and people, uh, you know, uh, bow in front of the icons and the icons are glittering and you, your mind goes into this, this, this head this headspace where you have a suburban Catholic parish that's whitewashed walls and a lot of chit chat and it's a meeting hall and there's nothing sacred. So why would you have beautiful no. art in that space? Because you just don't, you don't need it. You don't, people don't want it. It's gone. And well, um, somewhere, and I, I do think this was the, the, the beast that crept into the Catholic Church and has really, really poisoned the minds of a lot of uh, both priests, religious and, and laity, where um, they associate bad taste with humility. <laughs> do you know what I mean? No, um, could, you, could you expand that? I think I sure. do. I'd like, I'd like it's to... The, it's the, it's the, uh, it's the alabaster urn syndrome where the money should be spent on the poor. Well, who Christ didn't say that. Judas did. So it's the it's the taste of Judas here, where you're associating bad taste or uh, or something that looks bad with humility. And I think that's where the, the that whole Vatican Nativity thing came from. That's just bad. And you're thinking of it as being humble or something, and it's not. It's wrong. And it's bad. And you know, as if you know, oh well, you know, our Lord was born in a sable. So another, oh, the King of Kings doesn't ever get an upgrade here. 
You know, he's got to be condemned to the state. We know what that was about. We know why. But it's just a ridiculous sort of excuse for bad taste. And I've, I've seen this where um, I had one, one parish that I worked for because this came up where, uh, you know, it concerned a commission of mine that I had done pro bono and that was my business. Oh. It was done in memory of my father. How dare you come to me and say the money should have been spent on the poor? I didn't argue. I just, I went to the pastor. Well, they, and sound, he's the one. They, they sound like Judas. Yeah. So and I said, you know, <sighs> Father, what am I supposed to do? I don't I didn't want people to know I did this pro bono in memory of my dad. And he said, and he rolled his head back and laughed. And he said, huh, the charity of Judas. And I said, what do you mean? He said, the alabaster urn. Who is the one who says the money should have been spent on the poor? Judas. He said, and I, I remember, he said, there's one thing I want you to remember from all this. And what does Christ say? She does a good thing. Exactly. Okay. And that was it. So, um, and he went on because here he is in a rectory. He's got this, what seems to be a beautiful uh, uh, Persian rug. He said, I got this for $5 and it's sewn in the middle. If you look, you'll see the seam. Wow. And this is from this. And this was, you know, it was all sort of collected and it looked great, though. And then I remember a year or two later, I went to this Franciscan retreat. And here's these brick walls that you pay, they paid a lot for to get them stripped down to the brick, you know, because it looks more humble. And this, you know, burnt brown, orange shag rug that cost a mint. It's like you you have the look of humility, but you're really expensive. So yeah, yeah the, the look of humility sometimes, and I think we're dealing with that uh, to some degree here um, in, in the Catholic Church still, because great, beautiful art really doesn't cost all that much. And, and that's and, usually the yeah. perfect. It really doesn't. And, ug and yeah. ugly, ugly is expensive because the LA Cathedral in my neck of the wood proved that. Oh. Oh, but you know who saw all this coming, Joseph, is Pope Pius XII. Yeah. <laughs> he saw this, and when, especially after World War II, when he saw the uh, rehabilitation of, of a lot of the churches that had got, gotten bombed out, and I started to do research this, and I thought, wait a minute, these drawings for these churches were done in the 30s, before the Second World War, and one of them, I mean, it, 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 it's from Germany, but it's, it's again, a north sort of north-south north, thing. And this floor plan looks, it's in the shape of a cockroach. A Bauhaus or something. Bauhaus. Yeah, the Bauhaus was, Bauhaus wanted to take over Rome. And uh, Pius XII saw this, and he would write about how the church is about invention, not experimentation. Yeah. So... The churches get bombed out. You start to see these, you know, these old black and white photos of these, you know, bare one light bulb things coming down a perfect row. Uh, we can't get marble. Sure you can. So we just cut, we cast this concrete slab for our <laughs> altar. And it went on and on and on. And that's when he calls on Salvador Dali and says, help, yeah. help. And Salvador Dali, of course, you know, has a, a conversion through all that and, and does the, the crucifixion of St. John of the Cross and, and all these wonderful pieces of Catholic, you know, great Catholic art. Like we have that in Washington, D.C., we have the, uh, um, his last supper painting, try to find it, try to find it. They keep moving it around there. It's an embarrassment. It doesn't fit in the 20th century collection. Mm. Sometimes it's stuck on a stairwell, sometimes next to the elevators in the, in the uh, cafeteria area. It doesn't fit into their modernist collection. And yet he's a 20th century painter. Hmm. So. Yeah, I, ca I call some of those German, those German architectural works uh, a Death Star churches. They're just really, yeah. really awful. But, and you um, know, the, and, and they seize the opportunity. Got, uh, Vatican II, they seize the opportunity. We can move in now. This is what we've been wanting all along. And the beautiful doesn't necessarily have to be grand. I mean, here in California, one of my favorite missions, it's, it's a, it's probably one of the dumpiest of the missions. It's Soledad. It's out in the middle of nowhere. It's very tiny, but they have these beautiful retablos. And 
it's just the way it's set up with this thick, you know, walls, the, the adobe walls and it there. And I walk in there and there's, and it's poor, but there's something that, in that room that transports you. It's, it's the feeling of the, the coldness from the, from the air and the adobe and the retablos. And so yeah. it doesn't have to be big. Yeah. No, no. I, I, in fact, um, the 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 church I go to in Florence is, you know, I'm surrounded by you know all this great stuff, and um, I go to a little parish that does not have great art in it. It is not on the tourist map at all. Nobody goes there to see anything, and yet it's. It's one of the richest communities I've ever encountered in my life. Mm. And it's not ugly at all. It's, it's quite handsome. It's got good bone structure, as they say, you know. Um, it got um, ruined in the, in, after, after Vatican II. Um, frescoes were covered up with cardboard and glue. Italy's kind of tough this way because they have these Belliotti moved in and said, you can't do that, especially if it's this old. But then now we're talking about 1970. So then these guys took advantage of that period and did some horrific things and put in modernist sculptures and baptismal fonts. And now they're just darkened spaces. They're, they're unusable. So then Belliotti comes in again and says, if it's over 50 years old, you can't change it. You can't get rid of it. So you're stuck between these two, you know, horrible things where, and then if you want to restore the fresco, Belliotti comes in again. You're not allowed to touch it because these guys really ruined such great things that you have to have state approval to even restore them oh. and then raise the money on your own and bring in, you know, and then they'll, they'll check it every week, every month if they have to, and it takes forever to, get things done but the, the thing is that um i just fell in love with this community and the reverence toward the blessed sacrament and um that sort of you know for me you know out of all the great churches in florence that are, of course got to pay to get into now it's another <laughs> area that you know i'll go we can go on maybe another time where you've taken our patrimony you put it into museums and now we have to pay to see it. And it's no longer part of our liturgy. They've, they've done that in California with the missions too. Yeah, the church has done that yeah. as well. So um, we have it. We're not experiencing that here on, on the East Coast uh, at all. Uh, we just close them. That's all. We just close them. It doesn't go to a museum. Nothing's of that quality that it would go to a museum. It just gets mm, what they're doing in Philadelphia Archdiocese, they have a, a repository of stained glass and, and, and marble statues and things like that. And it was Cardinal Regali who really put a stop to it being just put on the open market. No, you have to first be a church within the Archdiocese of Philadelphia who is in need of it. A new church is being built can come in and, and, and have it. Or if not in Philadelphia, then for example, like. Um, Bishop Burbage uh, took a lot of incredible stained glass windows from Most Blessed Sacrament. Um, and, and he's using some and then others from other parishes that got closed. I, I, know, so I, it is being reused. I know a couple of TLM parishes, um, even one here in California, that's how they, they got, it's interesting, that's how they got a high altar, you know, from uh, a church that sure. had been closed. And so that, that artwork is you know, alive again and in, 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 in the space that it was, that it was meant to be. So. But we both know, and I think we could, we could safely say that, you know, whatever Mahoney did there in LA, that's not going to get recycled. It's just going to come down and maybe go into some other, you know, uh, uh, civil museum, if anything, um, forget about it. Yeah. It's, 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 it's bad art. Uh, I, I've kept you too long. I, I kind of, I always try with these discussions, I try to kind of uh, come back and sort of uh, tie everything up. I'm going to try it. Um, what, okay. And you mentioned this to me too, and it's something that I'm very, very, very um, keenly aware of. I mean, it's been probably the focal point of all my writing, 
and that's um, fatherhood, um, fatherlessness, um, yes. masculinity. In my book, I I kind of I kind of threw all this together uh, in terms of post-industrial civilizations, not civilization, mm -hmm. post-industrial cultures, which is America's the epitome of, is where, um, especially in the United States and the rise of suburbia, um, the fathers a lot of times were taken out of the home. Um, they had long commutes and uh, fathers were really not a part of daily life. Even in, even in, in an urban setting, where uh, dads usually worked. I mean, people didn't have cars a lot. In an urban setting, dad took the, the subway or walked to work at a factory or whatever. Well, uh, you know, he was building buildings or whatever. But dads, and there was a neighborhood and dads and men were much more part of daily life. Suburbia things had changed. It's much more leave it to Beaver and the Cleavers where, you know, June Cleaver's yeah. home with the kids and, and dad sort of pops in at the end of the day, has a drink and, you know, collapses in front of the TV. And I think with the priests, um, and all this is, is coinciding with all this radical change in the liturgy. And I think priests, um, you didn't have that hierarchy, especially just in the parish level. Um, it's much more committee driven. And you mentioned this. Um, yes. Uh, much more involvement, uh, and I'm 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 not a sexist, but much more involvement of women, a heavy involvement of women. I mean, you you have to be, you have to have your head in the sand to not realize that in the contemporary Catholic culture, for better or worse, women are a big part of it in the liturgy, in everything that goes on in Catholic education. I never had a male. I went all through Catholic school it, until I got to high school. There were some male teachers, but you know, I never had any in grammar school. It was it was a completely female environment. Yeah, and me too. so yeah, so as a consequence, I think priests that didn't have involved, engaged fathers, I think they grow up um, to become priests who are a bit wishy-washy, who are very unsure of themselves. I think they're very willing to abdicate a lot of decisions to committees, to councils. And you see that in the liturgy where the priest is kind of, okay, I got to get up uh, and do the homily and I got to do the transubstantiation. But sometimes actually I'll let the Mary Deacon do the homily. So I'll just, you know, I'm sort of like a facilitator here. Yeah. Um, it, it's and, funny you should use that word because that's exactly what Joseph Campbell taught, called our priests years ago. Oh, I didn't know he that. They have been reduced. They have reduced themselves to mere facilitators. Okay, and then and I think you you see that sort of in the uh, the altar, yeah, yeah, um, where you had that breakage in art too, where um, if you look at the master in an altar setting. He's sort of like a father figure. I don't want to push that too far, but I mean, no, you have he's, a, he's, he's a male mentor. It, it is a mentor role. Right. So you, and you have apprentices. And I think that has been lost in the church. And you talked about it with altar boys. And I wrote an article about altar boys because I was kind of in that weird space um, when there mm -hmm. were only altar boys and it shifted to altar girls. And, and I, I, yeah. I thought I wrote a pretty good essay about it, especially coming from somebody like me who was alienated from other boys and men just in my life in general, just in my family and in school. And where at least at, at church where the sanctuary, not the sanctuary, the sacristy was still sort of an all-male area for the priest and oh, yeah, the altar boys. And then I saw where it just shifted and you had the women lectors in there and the women Eucharist ministers and the women, uh, the girl altar girls and everything changed. And I, I just think you see that in the arts. And, and but that, I think and, what's happening also is, is we, the metaphor and symbolism is gone. The, 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 the church is no longer, I mean, it, how can our priests treat the church 
uh, as men if they don't see the church as the bride. Yeah. It's gone. It's just a it, building, yeah. not the bride. So and, um, and I think and I think these men who who for whatever reason I'm gonna say be overly general and say um, didn't have didn't have involved fathers. I think it's 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 also created these celebrity priests. And I'm really thinking of the LA Cathedral where everything is just like focus on the priest and the all, you know, right there. And where the priest has to perform and the priest has to be loved and the priest has to receive applause. And whether in the TLM where the priest is really um, in persona Christi and um, everything tends to work together, the music, everything, the art, the, and it's so focused on this priest who needs to be popular and who needs to be accepted by parishioners so therefore, you know, we're not going to do anything controversial. And er no. I think everything su suffers. So everything. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, my parish here, before, but when it was a parish, happened to be the National Shrine of St. Rita of Kasha. So here you've got this. If you want to, you know, talk about women, it's amazing. <laughs> I... I, I go to these meetings and they'd say, well, we've got to bring people in, do something. I said, you've got a titular saint of the church who got married at a very young age, even though she wanted to become a religious. Her husband was murdered. Her two sons were taken from her during the plague while they wanted to avenge their father's life. And she prayed that they didn't. She's a late vocation. And what do you do? Oh, you have weekly meetings for guys addicted to porn. Well, What's that about? Okay. And why? Nothing. You, you all say you want to do something for women. You've never had anything about child loss. Yeah. Okay. Whether it's through drug addiction, uh, missing, missing death, early death, whatever. Nothing. Nothing. And I get answers like, well, Anthony, you're just trying, that's going to tax our staff. I said, who's talking about you? You got to bring people in that know what they're doing if you want to handle these kinds of things. So I, I find them, Joseph, to answer, I find them talking out both sides of their mouths about how pro feminine or feminist they are. And I think, again, it has something to do with, gee, you, there is that weakness in the male role that you don't understand it. You don't understand your, your male female role here. So, um, yeah. It's it's amazing, but I find there it's it's inconsistency and, and hypocritic at the same time because they don't really know how to or what to do with that female aspect within the church, either of the church, in the church, or or whichever. They don't know how to do it. So they say, Oh gee, we've got to have uh women on the committee. <laughs> okay, well, you don't even need men on the committee if you knew what you were doing. That's how I feel. I mean, I, 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 I've worked with, uh, again, this one Monsignor, when we met each other, he had a gigantic, he inherited a gigantic committee for the, um, you know, the, the, the design of the church and, and everything that went into it. And um, it, it must have been 20 people. And this one woman would come in every week and she'd, she'd have this big fat catalog of all the, you know, uh, bad Catholic art and she'd say, I'm ready anytime you are. And we knew we weren't going to go that way because Monsignor wanted original work and he got a lot of it, you know, um, that way. So um, how do you, how do I find artists? How do I commission them? Uh, help me write a contract. I did all those things, but it got down to what do I do with the committee? So he, 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 said and I think it's because he had a strong mother and father I, 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 I had met them and um and loving sisters it had nothing to do with male it, but he said he had a party at the rectory one night he had you know there's cake and coffee and there's wine and cheese over there for uh and I just want to thank you for all your work you've given us every, all the information we need now you can go and that was it no more committee and boy, did things speed up. Yeah, there, so, are, there um, are a lot. There are a lot of weak 
needy Roman Catholic priest. And, yeah. and, I've, and I've, there's an example in, in my area, God bless him, where this priest had fortitude. And, you know, he came into an ugly, ugly church, aesthetic, you know, aesthetically ugly. And mm -hmm. um, he, you know, he started with the liturgy, too. We're going to have a more reverent liturgy. And then we're going to turn, you know, artistically this church around. But that takes that takes a that takes a certain kind of priest and they're they're few, far, they're few and far between so it's interesting that if if you got a priest with fortitude with guts with courage and you know he, he wants to have a more sacred liturgy and you know a more sacred space for catholics to be in to worship in it takes a lot of guts it does it it takes guts and i i think i'm i'm hoping that the, one of the ways this gets to turn around is by artists assisting them and saying, Father, I'll support you. I can, and not to sell their own stuff. That's not working either. But, um, or these, these sort of Catholic renovation guilds that move in and completely take over and no other artists is to be included. It's, it's essentially work for hire. Yeah. And I don't think we were ever about that or should we be where, it's sort of like being an author and it's like, well, um, I, I want to buy a book and I have to, it doesn't say uh, uh, Joseph Schomburg, it says Simon and Schuster. Well, that's what these guilds are doing. It says, I don't want to mention names here, but you'll never know who did the work. We have a right to authorship and identity for sure in the Catholic Church, we always did. So we're, we're kind of stuck between the over-the-counter guys and these guilds that move in and, and they'll do something, again, I don't want to mention names, they'll, they'll, they'll take these wonderful frescoes uh, by uh, Fra Angelico or Masaccio and put them in your church, reproduced on canvas or gicle print, and crop them. See, now you're art historian size because, they, no, they didn't crop the Giotto. Yes, they did. They cropped it because it didn't fit in that church. So... Um, we, 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 we got a lot, a lot, a lot of work to do, a lot. But I do think it takes not a committee because the committees are leading us that other way. We need to get priests with fortitude, like you said. Yeah, I'm, I'm a bit more um, cynical because I had that brick and mortar store and I saw the bad taste in Catholics. And I, I talked about this oh. recently when I wrote a, an article about Chinese religious imports. And I, I was trying oh. to bring in... I was trying to Don't, bring in please. from Italy. I was trying to bring in. That's one like, of my pet peeves. My pet peeves is the bad Chinese Catholic tchotchke art that is filling our taken, religious goods stores. How dare you? It's How taken dare over. You? So I, this, I had, I was, my store was during the last gasp. I was still able to get like Ruggieri and Santini and stuff. Some of these stuff yeah. that are more interesting, but they're kind of gone. And now everything is Chinese. And I was trying to educate the, the public, like saying, well, this Italian import is more a little more expensive, but look, you know, it's, it's you know, I'm, I'm trying to teach them. But I said, look at this Chinese import. Yes, it's cheaper, but the eyes are dotted. It's just, it's just bad taste. Oh, but boy. Catholics, I mean, Catholic priests a lot of times have bad taste, but so does the laity. They don't get it. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I try to attack it, to, to tell you the truth, just, I've tried to attack it politically. I said, you're buying merchandise from a country that doesn't even allow the Catholic Church to appoint its own bishops. How do you justify this? And it, it's, uh, it's getting complicated because we now have merchants that are convincing our priests to get it done in China. And these are commissions, for example, where a sculptor makes something, and this is actually happening now as we speak. The sculptor is local, did a beautiful sculpture of Our Lady of the Unborn. The committee that's paying for it though, wants it in marble. So the vendor says, okay, I'll get it sent to China. Yeah, yeah. The committee, wait a minute, we're talking about anti-abortion and you want it done in China. Mm. Okay. So the committee says, no, we want it done in white Carrara marble and we want it done 
anywhere but China. Oh, good. Then there goes the pastor and says, well, okay, I'll get a piece of white Carrara marble and send it to China. Yeah. Not getting it. You're still not getting it. These are true stories. I'm not making one word. So then the vendor comes back, the agent or whoever comes back and says, well, okay, it can get done in Italy and they'll do a CNC machine to do a lot of the carving. But those parts are made in China too. So what's the difference? Oh. They keep trying to get around it by saying, we're going to give this sculpture. And I've had this happen to me where I've lost commissions. I don't feel like I lost them, but get it cast in China. And they go, I'm out. Absolutely. And this is pre-COVID, pre-anything. I've been absolutely nothing from China for quite a while in terms of my work. Nothing. Can't come from there. God bless you. God bless you. It, again, I think it's just poor leadership in in terms yeah. of the 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 prelates, because we, I mean the Vatican has openly you know negotiated and and signed uh, treaties with with the Chinese Communist Party. So what 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 do you do? So yeah, exactly. But I think you do it again. Little one. I'm 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 working with this uh, young man right now in. Um, up in Mystic, Connecticut, he is sort of new and he wants to really help people get these things together. So we're gonna work on something about making your own home chapel prayer space and yeah. what kind of work to put in it. He's got an interesting take on this, Joseph, where he's saying, if you get them to put quality art in their own little, like you have behind you, yes. they'll expect it when they go to church. Okay. We're I gonna, love. We're going to try to get. We're, we're going to try to get back in the garden through the back gate. I love that. That's perfect. Now, see, that was one of the things I loved about Russian Orthodox is you really need an icon corner. In um, yes. and I and I have to say, reproductions in Russian Orthodoxy are pretty darn good. I mean, sometimes oh, yeah, yeah. sometimes it's just a serigraph that's been laminated to a piece of wood. But I I have to say they're pretty they're pretty good. They're not bad. I mean, for somebody, why, that, why, uh, would, why would you buy a plastic whatever from China, a Padre Pio that looks like Wolfman Jack? <laughs> Ridiculous. I mean, just this, you know, bearded hunchback guy with those like the black dot eyes that they always put on on what they think uh, Catholic saints are supposed to look like. Yeah, I think I think we're we're on to something here with help people show them how easy it is to do your prayer corner with quality and dignity and they're going, maybe hopefully they'll expect it in their churches or a home chapel. I'm, I'm developing one here, um, mainly because I see where things are going. And for my atelier students who are predominantly Catholic, um, I've had two priests say, we'll do a vigil mass here. Five, you know, you have classes on a Saturday or something, we'll, we'll come at, at five o'clock and we'll, we'll have liturgy here. I welcome it because, you know, I, I, you know, and it's not just all my stuff, you know, I, I found art, good art from other people that I've, I've purchased in, um, we have a vintage store here in Philadelphia that aside from the 90% of the Chinese junk you got over there, you've got this vintage corner where, and I've, I've gotten a, a beautiful repose of, um, our data just a hold up. I don't know where it came from, but mm -hmm. I, I I cherish it. And a few other things, and a beautiful little carving of uh, uh, Our Lady um, in wood. It's I, I don't want to call it primitive. It's it's but it, it's done. You could tell the person since there's a sincerity in it, and that seems that's a, that's another kind of beauty. It's, it's not you know, done crudely on purpose or, or disfigured. It's just, this is this is the best I can do. And I'm doing this figure of Our Lady. So I, fine, I'm putting that there too. I'm putting all these things in the spaces. I, I, I think there's hope too. And this goes back to the fatherhood masculinity issue. I think when boys have good role models uh, as f fathers who are selfless, who suffer for their families, who aren't out 
who who their who really their focus is their family, their wife and their kids. And I think priests priests need to do that. Priests, you're not going to be popular. You're not going to be a celebrity priest. You're just going to do the drudger the drud work. And a lot of times yeah. that's that's what art is. Sometimes art, I mean, a lot of times art is sure. not glamorous. And I and I go back to Michelangelo and reading those descriptions of him painting the Sistine Chapel it was almost like him being disemboweled, where he was like just in such pain, horrendous. And he never got rich. He was famous during his lifetime. But um, yeah. it, it was, it, it, I think for me, the great art has, has a, and, it's, and you talked about this in one of your essays and I, I didn't get to go back to it. Um, you talked about great art, great artists and, and, and great saints and, and, this, and sort of how they all kind of converge in suffering. And I, I think people nowadays in general, I mean, I don't rush towards suffering. I don't want suffering. I mean, nobody. No, no. I know, but it's nobody really. No. But, but I think in the, the creative process, whether it's in a family, you know, creating a family or creating art, I think there there is going to be suffering. And, I, and I've encountered this. With There's going to be sacrifice. Yeah, There's sacrifice. Sacri and I've, I've encountered this with parents a lot of times. Let's see who, who have an SSA or LGBTQ kid or whatever who who they're having difficulty with and they don't want to go down that road of suffering and, and I don't blame them. And I sure. think art, art it too, it's just, especially religious art. I, I think there has to be that element of self-sacrifice and, and suffering because yeah. um, you're probably not going to make a lot of money out of it and uh, you'll make a living. But I, I, I think to, to have it be great, I, I think there needs to be humility, self-sacrifice, suffering, just like there is in fatherhood sure. and and sure. and in the family. Sure. Yeah, I I, I think um, you know we we have some great examples, and uh, especially in our saints, and and in, you know I I I said this at, at, at one retreat I was at. I, I don't know why you know why Michelangelo isn't being considered for, you know, he, did, he didn't even get to be serving to God after all this, come on. <laughs> I mean, the, the conversions through one man's art, the conversions, I, 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 it's amazing. And, um, and that's why we've got to be careful not to pull anything out of these churches again and more uh, than they already are in Italy because it's, it's not, the conversion experience isn't there. You need a priest there. You need liturgy there. You can't, you're separating uh, uh, the reasons why these things existed and were made to begin with. It was to serve the liturgy. I think and, if, uh, yeah. I, I went to, when I was in Rome, I stayed in Rome for quite a while and I went to a little church. It's where St. Um, uh, Benedict Joseph Labre was. And it's, it's a beautiful little church. And I went there every day and the liturgy was horrendous. And so despite the beautiful space I was in, yeah, it just, it just didn't, it didn't soar. I just, I felt so earthbound. And so yeah. beautiful art there, but consequently, this is interesting too. When I was in Pennsylvania, when the FSSP was up in um, Northeastern Pennsylvania, they were in this dumpy little uh, old hotel where they had the seminary at the time. And they had a very makeshift sort of chapel and it was, it was okay. They did the best they could, but the liturgy was so gorgeous and you soared. But when you really have the art and architecture, the music and everything comes together and the liturgy, it's just boom, you know. <laughs> it's, it's the seamless garment. You know, it's the seamless garment. I mean, uh, it, again, St. Rita of Kasha was built in, in 1907. It is some people that that know that it looks like the first act of Tosca. It is just the most beautiful Baroque church in Philadelphia. And the liturgy is so lackluster and it doesn't match. And you, here you are in this, you know, uh, th this church with Corinthian columns and marble and 
you know, you're, you're trying to, please, I don't ever want to hear gather us in again. <laughs> or here you I know, am. And you realize that all these things were written in three quarter timing for the, you know, what I call the not ready for prime time liturgical prancers. They're all waltz music that there's there. You don't, you know, it's, it's, it's gotta, it's gotta, it will stop because, you know, we're just not going to go to those masses anymore. And we're going to have liturgy at home because I think we're headed for that for a lot of different reasons. But let's start with these home chapels. I'm all for this. I'm going to help this guy as much as I can. And maybe we're thinking of putting a course together this summer. Yeah, I had I had a, I, I had like a brain explode moment when the first time I walked into the Russian cathedral in um, San Francisco and you had the male baritone voices and then you had all the icons and it, it just was like man this is this is this is based i mean i couldn't no. believe it no. No. <laughs> the east did, it's it's sad the east didn't lose didn't lose it like the west did the west just uh, the west has so much work to do and people like you are doing the heavy heavy lifting um, the, man the undoing modernism is is really a, it really is tough it's very it's a it's um it's an addiction See, I see, I see modernism as an addiction. And uh, unless you know that you're addicted to, you know, people that, that have that sort of thing where, uh, well, we can see it in fashion where, okay, I did this and that to my hair and I got that pierced and this and that and I'm wearing this and I'm going to get on the bus and everybody's going to look at me and, and then I'm going to get mad. What are you looking at me? I mean, I mean, um, this is unacceptable. And then people get used to it and they say, okay, you know, it looks like her mother slept with a parrot, big deal. And that Foucault, then that, once, that, once they get to that level, then they got to outdo themselves again and outdo themselves again. And it, it, again, it's very, very much like art school. So yeah, modernism becomes an addiction and it's a hard one to break unless you know that that's uh, the, the road you're on. Um, it's going to be tough, but we have a whole culture that's on it right now and, and a church in a sense. Yeah, M Michael Foucault was the one that said everybody is, I I'm paraphrasing, but he said everybody is a work of art. It's not just, you know, these guys. It's, it's yeah. everyone is a work of art. And Andy Warhol was onto this too. It's like everybody has their 15 minutes. And I know, I know, and that's the space we're living in now. It's, it's. Sure. Oh, it's really. Oh, yeah. It's Everybody's like, got Instagram. I know, and it's and there's nothing worse. I have to say, God bless the good ones, but there's nothing worse than a priest on social media. Talk about bad art. It's like bad. It's like bad performance art. It's just like it's. <laughs> you know what's interesting, Joseph? And I thank you for bringing that up. I don't know. You know, as as much as I post on different pages of Facebook, whether it's Atelier for the Sacred Arts, my own, you know, whatever page, in, which I put art on as well, or Lessons of the Florentine Masters. I don't have any priest followers. And I think, what, or do you want to, or uh, and other artists don't either. It's like, what do you guys follow on social media? You certainly don't follow Catholic art. Very I weird. don't know. Yeah, Very I weird. don't know. It's like all the SJs follow the SJs and they um, they're the worst. It's the Jesuits. And, and you brought up St. Ignatius several times and the Jesuits are just atrocious. They're iconoclasts. They're um, heretics. I'll say it. I'm not part of it anymore. So um, bad taste, bad art, bad liturgy. I, bad I, could, ju I could just get the sense of how you feel every time you see Father Martin's grin yeah. on social media, how he's smiling at the next thing he's going to do. He's like the Cheshire, wow. I can't compare it, he's like the Cheshire cat from Alice in Wonderland. Yeah. It's like so devious. And um, that the, the yeah. pat, you know, the heritage that that order inherited and how it's been just horribly, horribly squandered and oh, yeah. um and oh, yeah. and they control really... and they control the universities which is yes. it's all interconnected with culture and um 
I don't know. I was I was raised by the social justice warriors Jesuits. That's that's who who formed me. And and they wow. create they create um, gay atheists. That's pretty much what they create. And um, interesting. Yeah. But I remember Father Benedict Rochelle Garcelle saying, you know, uh, he felt that St. Ignatius of Loyola was rolling in his grave. This is not the order he founded. They've become something else. It's a shame, but um, yeah. But their their orders, they're they're not growing. They're not growing, you know. So no. that, that's good, you know. If if um, uh, they they they've outlived their their other than politics, they've outlived their usefulness. Um, they certainly aren't the liturgists they once were. They aren't the homeless they once were. So uh, I don't I don't I was at at a Jesuit parish before I moved into this neighborhood. And um, I could see it declining. You know, even then I had to leave. Um, there was uh, one pastor who, I don't even want to mention some of the things he did, but I remember one Sunday after, um, it was Epiphany, and he came over. We had sort of coffee hour social afterwards, and he, he got behind me, put his hands on my shoulders, and he said, isn't it cute that Anthony really believes in the wise men? <laughs> and I said, you know, there's only one thing from the gospel I'm going to quote, okay? And that is the last line. That once they saw the Christ child, they chose a different way home. And I got up and left. Yeah, stupid. That it was they, so stupid, so mean, and you know, ridic he, he'd like to ridicule people for believing things, and um, uh, they had to get rid of him actually because he did some pretty scandalous things. That usually you know? goes that usually goes hand in hand. The 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 yeah, Jesuits like to scandalize people. Yeah, the Jesuits have become like the intersection for all of these um, grievance groups in the Catholic Church, and and I saw it in San Francisco at St. Ignatius, which is this interesting, you know, like neo-Romanesque church. It sits on the, it's a, it's a grand location. It sits on this hill and ugh, you just see everything. And when you walk in the, the, the church and there's all the, I guess it used to be all the side altar on the side. And it's like each little niche is sort of dedicated to like some sort of grievance, some sort of intersection identity group in the church yeah. and i'm just like oh my god this is what it's become this is yeah. art and this is um this is it it's like this is really uh sadistic <laughs> just i haven't been i haven't been to san francisco in probably well no it's no 30 years but i remember i was going to a church I think it was called St. Francis of Assisi. Is there a church? That, it, it had a park in front of it or, you know. Um, the one St. Francis of Assisi I know is in North Beach. Um, and that's where the relics are. There's uh, Mission Dolores. Oh, that was probably Mission Dolores um, in um, the Mission District. Okay. That's no, that. I wasn't in the Mission. I was staying with a friend who had an apartment uh, in Chinatown. And uh, it's the church where Marilyn Monroe and Joe DiMaggio oh, were married. That's that's Saint that's Saint Peter and that's Saint Peter and Paul. Okay, but it was there were Franc Franciscan priests there at the time. I think now it's the Salesians are there, and and the okay. Francis and the Franciscans. Yeah, this is probably about ninety, yeah. about ninety-two. Oh yeah, I wasn't and, even I wasn't even Catholic then. I was over in the Castro, but yeah, and it was ninety-two. Like, I remember. The, the 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 Chinese would come out and do Tai Chi in the morning in front of the yes, church. Yes, they, they still do, they still do that. They still do it, and that's a okay. love. That's a so beautiful that, church, built by Italian immigrants. Yeah. What well, and yeah, one so last thing? Why? Sure, sure. One last Go thing on. I wanted Go to ahead. bring up with you too is that I thought was interesting is that there's a, and and this goes back to the snobbishness of of modern art and and what Tom Wolfe talked about is that mm -hmm. I think even now, and I, I think maybe the Hispanic influx into the Catholic Church in the United States 
has probably had a, a good influence uh, where they they come from a more figurative uh, culture where, yes. you know, churches yeah. like St. Peter and Paul were, where, um, you know, where my dad was when he was a teenager, um, that was built by immigrants. And I think sort of figurative, you know, classic realism was always associated with sort of the uneducated, unwashed peasantry in the United States, the Italians, the Irish. And then yeah. you had this new, you know, liturgy and the new art come in, which was much more enlightened. So I, and I think there's still mm -hmm. that prejudice nowadays, where if you have a more conservative traditional art form, that's considered, you know, less than what something is abstract and modern, you know, that's more enlightened. Well, this, this is the problem. Exactly. This is a good point. This is the problem that we're facing with our current pontiff, where he doesn't get that that kind of ugly art that he subscribes to is really elitist. You That's think it. it looks humble because it's badly made, but That's it is it. actually an elitist art form. That's it. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. I'm glad. <laughs> That's it. And you see it in the parish level too. You see oh, it God, yeah. Where, yeah. where Catholics yeah. have changed because a lot of times Catholicism is not an image. Well, in California, it's becoming that way. California is not so much an immigrant religion. It's you have a lot of educated people and it's it's yeah. different, especially in L.A. and San Francisco. The people that are involved, especially with the parishes, are wealthy and, you know, they're much more into social justice and all this stuff. And uh, yeah. the past is the past. And that was, you know, we've moved on, you know, to more abstract ideas. Sure, <laughs> sure. Thank you so Hello. much. I took I took up Thank way you. Thank you. I took up way too much of your time. I could talk to you like all day. Just well, maybe we'll do it. Well, maybe if, if some of these other things come up and there's a topic in particular that uh, you want to do or or whatever, we, we, we'll we'll continue I, to be continued. How's that? I, I I made all these notes and I I didn't even get to half of it. I mean, I knew I wouldn't, but I just. Joseph, I, it, I just wanted to if, pick you, pick your brain like forever. Okay. If, if there's something that you say, I didn't get that down in time, just write or call or something. Okay. But, but thank, thank you for being super generous with your time and, and oh, your sure. talent I Yeah, for, for talking to just somebody like me. So. Oh, come on. You're, you're a, a published author and you've got oh. a, 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 no, I've, I've seen you've got a large following. So I'm, anyway, I'm, I'm self-published, but thank Thank you so much. God bless you for the work that you're God doing. God bless you too, Joseph. You be well. All right. Take care now. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.